Hey everyone, this lesson is on lactic acidosis. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what lactic acidosis actually means. We're also going to talk about the various causes and subtypes of lactic acidosis. And we're going to talk about how lactic acid is produced and cleared from our body. So first, I want to talk about the definition of what hyperlactatemia is. Hyperlactatemia is lactic or lactate levels greater than 2 millimoles per liter. Whereas lactic acidosis, the topic of this lesson, is when lactate levels are greater than 4 millimoles per liter. So that's an important distinction to make. Hyperlactatemia, or high levels of lactate, are when lactate levels are between 2 to 4 millimoles per liter, whereas anything greater than 4 millimoles per liter of lactate is considered lactic acidosis. So why is lactic acidosis important? Well, it is the most common cause of metabolic acidosis in hospitalized patients. And it occurs when lactic acid production exceeds the clearance of lactic acid. That makes sense. And lactic acid itself is cleared by the liver. Now it's normal to make lactic acid and a normal daily production of lactic acid is generally from 15 to 20 millimoles per kilogram of body weight. And we make lactic acid through glucose utilization and alanine deamination. Lactic acid can then be processed by the Cori cycle to produce glucose. So about 15 to 20% of lactic acid is processed in this way. And the most of the rest of the lactic acid undergoes primary oxidation to carbon dioxide and water. About 70 to 80% of the lactic acid undergoes this process. So We've talked about how glucose utilization and alanine deamination can produce lactic acid. So I'm going to talk about the pathways here. So glucose can be directed into several different pathways. It can be directed into glycogen production, or it can be utilized in glycolysis, and generally it occurs in muscles. And the end product of glycolysis is pyruvate, and that's essentially where our story begins. So when there's oxygen present, pyruvate can be directed into the mitochondria to undergo the TCA cycle, or the pyruvate can be converted into alanine by the enzyme alanine amino transferase, or ALT. So essentially, glutamate can add a amino group to the pyruvate to form alanine, and vice versa, because this enzyme is a reversible enzyme, alanine can be converted into pyruvate by deamination. And pyruvate can also be acted on by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH, essentially oxidizing an NADH to an NAD plus to form lactate or lactic acid. So lactate dehydrogenase does this, it oxidizes NADH to NAD plus, so that NAD plus can be re- uh, used in the glycolysis pathway when there's no oxygen present. So essentially, whenever we have oxygen, we can route pyruvate into the TCA cycle. If there's no oxygen present, so anaerobic conditions, we can essentially recycle the NADH to NAD plus to be used in glycolysis. And we have to use lactate dehydrogenase enzyme to convert the, lac uh, convert the pyruvate to lactate. And vice versa, the lactate can also be converted into pyruvate under the right circumstances as well. So all of these can lead to the production of lactate or lactic acid. So alanine deamination can lead to the production of pyruvate, which can be routed into lactate as well. Now, the lactic acid can essentially be dumped into the blood through MCT1, and it can be buffered in the blood and exhaled in CO2, or it can be transferred and taken up by the liver and processed by the same enzyme, lactate dehydrogenase. So essentially in the liver, it does the opposite. So in the liver, we can take an NAD plus and reduce it to an NADH to produce pyruvate. And then we can then use the pyruvate in gluconeogenesis to produce glucose. So that's the Cori cycle. So we've got two ways of actually dealing with the lactate that's produced. It can either be buffered and exhaled as CO2, or it can be taken up by the liver and then processed via the Cori cycle to make glucose by glucose or gluconeogenesis. So you can imagine that if there's any issues with the liver, we can have a buildup of lactic acid. So this is the general schematic as to how lactic acid is produced and how it is processed in our body. So now that we know how lactic acid is produced and removed from our body, what are some of the causes of lactic acidosis? So lactic acidosis is again due to an excess accumulation of lactate. So anything that increases the production or decreases the utilization or removal of lactic acid can lead to lactic acidosis. So there are actually three main categories of causes of lactic acidosis. The first is an increased production of pyruvate. So this makes sense. If you're making more pyruvate, you might actually overwhelm TCA cycle uh, utilization, which can spill over and 
you can actually lead to increased production of lactic acid. So states like glycogen storage disease type 1, respiratory alkalosis, pheochromocytoma, beta agonists, and sepsis can all lead to an increased production of pyruvate. The second main category of cause is impaired mitochondrial utilization of pyruvate. So essentially, if there's an impaired mitochondrial utilization or impaired TCA cycle, the pyruvate is not going to be used. It's going to sit around. It's going to have to be processed by lactate dehydrogenase to essentially lead to the production of lactic acid. And the third main category of lactic acidosis causes is states of NADH accumulation or reduction of NAD plus to NADH ratio. So wherever you see a state of an increased NADH accumulation, the cell is going to have to recycle that NADH to NAD plus so that that NAD plus can be used in the glycolysis pathway as we mentioned earlier. And the cell utilizes lactate dehydrogenase to recycle the NADH to NAD plus, but in the meantime, it actually produces lactic acid as well. So states like increased metabolic rate, so if you're essentially making so much NADH in the cytosol, that NADH is going to have to be recycled to NAD+. You use the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme and you make lactic acid. Decreased delivery of oxygen. So again, that makes sense. If you're not able to have oxygen around, we're going to lead to lactic acid production and reduce utilization of oxygen as well. So now that we know the three main categories of causes of lactic acidosis, what are some of the subtypes? You might not have heard of this, but there's actually two main subtypes of lactic acidosis. There's type A and type B. Type A lactic acidosis is due to impaired oxygenation of tissues. So the causes of type A include hypovolemia, cardiac failure, sepsis, and cardiac arrest. So all of these lead to impaired oxygenation of tissues. The tissues don't have oxygen, so they can't use the pyruvate in the TCA cycle, which means that there's an increased production of lactic acid. So that's the cause of lactic acidosis. In the case of hypovolemia, you don't have enough blood volume to get oxygen to your tissue, so it's going to make lactic acid. Cardiac failure, you might have enough volume, but you just can't get the volume to where it needs to go. Sepsis is essentially the same reason. There's a increased vasodilation during sepsis, which leads to essentially hypotension and inability to get oxygen to the tissues. And cardiac arrest is similar to the cardiac failure in that we don't even get the blood and the oxygen to the tissues themselves. Type B lactic acidosis is essentially everything else. And it really means not due to impaired oxygenation of tissues. There are many causes of type B lactic acidosis. One of them is diabetes. So diabetes and medications used in diabetes can actually lead to lactic acidosis. By guanide use, so metformin, can lead to a lactic acidosis, especially in cases of renal failure and liver failure. Diabetic ketoacidosis can lead to a lactic acidosis and D-lactic acid accumulation derived from methyl glyoxal, which is a metabolite of acetone and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Another large cause of type B lactic acidosis is malignancy. So specifically malignancies that have high cell burdens like leukemia, lymphoma, and solid malignancies. These are generally due to the Warburg effect. So the Warburg effect is when there is an increase in anaerobic metabolism. And generally that with some cancers, specifically cancer cells within the center of a tumor, they can't get access to the oxygen like the cells closer to the blood supply. So they actually have to switch to anaerobic metabolism, which is called the Warburg effect. Alcoholism can be a cause of type B lactic acidosis. Essentially, it's due to the liver dysfunction that leads to decreased clearance of lactic acid. And there's an increased NADH production that leads to reduced NAD plus to NADH ratios, which increase the conversion of pyruvate to lactic acid. So that's one of the three main categories of causes we talked about earlier. HIV infection can lead to a type B lactic acidosis. It's a sepsis-induced lactic acidosis, not the same as the other type that we talked about in type A. Mitochondrial dysfunction, so certain mitochondrial diseases like MELAS. And another cause of type B lactic acidosis is beta agonists. So this is very interesting. So using IV epinephrine can actually lead to a type B lactic acidosis. And it does this because epinephrine increases glycogenolysis. So we, it increases glucose production, which will lead to increased pyruvate production. And epinephrine also leads to decreased GI perfusion. So it's almost like a type A lactic acidosis as well. And because we've got increased pyruvate production and decreased 
GI perfusion, this is all going to lead to increased lactic acid production. So both of these contribute to the type B lactic acidosis that's caused by beta agonists. Anyways, I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.